Well, <clears throat> thank you very much to Glenn and Stacy and Matt. Uh, hopefully this time will be fruitful for everyone that's here. I know we're all encouraged and we'd like to hear what you have to say on the topics. And uh, as I mentioned to them, I sent out uh, emails in advance and elicited all the different topics and questions that people were interested to hear about. So hopefully we'll cover the topic uh, that is of concern to you. And then if not, uh, we're going to try to keep this at about an hour and a half sharp. The candidates agree that based on the time frame, if we have a little time left over, they would take some questions from the audience if we don't cover uh, what's most important to you. So having said that, first question, and we're going to... Uh, give this first to Glenn and we're going to rotate these questions around and everybody will have a chance to respond to that. But first question is, uh, please give an introduction to yourself, a, br a brief background uh, of your history, and then really lastly, what motivated you to run for Texas House? Well, thank you, Daniel, and, and thanks to the Collin County GOP for allowing us to be here this evening so we could participate in this forum. My name is Glenn Callison and I am a candidate for the state representative House District 66 seat. I'm running for this seat to serve as a conservative, common sense voice for our district down uh, in Austin. Uh, I've been a 25 year resident of our district and during that time I really feel like I have the background to know what issues we're facing. This is an important race and we're facing some significant issues issues like water and transportation, issues like making sure our public school system stays strong, all the while making sure that our government stays small and limited and accountable back to the people who it serves and making sure taxes stay low. Uh, during the 25 years that I've been in the district, um, I've also served as an attorney for that same period of time for a large Texas commercial law firm. I practice in commercial real estate. That experience, including the last eight years while I've served as the chairman and CEO of our firm, has given me the background and the leadership skills to solve complex issues, issues like water, transportation, and education. And that's the kind of leadership that our district needs, the real world leadership to solve problems. And that's, uh, and that's why I want to go to Austin. Uh, lastly, uh, during the 25 years that I've been uh, in our district, I also understand what it is to give back to our community. I currently serve as the chairman of both the Heart Hospital and the Baylor Regional Medical Center of Plano. Uh, Baylor Plano was just awarded the Malcolm Baldridge Award. It's been an honor to be a part of that team. Being a public servant has always been who I am, and that is what I want to do when I go to Austin. Not to be a politician, but to be a public servant for our district. Thank you. Fantastic. Okay, Stacy, we would pose the same question to you. Good evening, everybody. My name is Stacy Chen. I'm running for the Texas House of Representatives here in District 66. Um, you know, first off, a little bit about myself. I was born in Arizona, uh, but I was raised in Denton, Texas, as well as here in Plano, Richardson, Dallas area. Um, growing up, my parents really made the made, really made it a really made. <laughs> it aware to myself and my siblings that education was the key to opportunity. So for us, I actually grew up going to school seven days a week, Monday through Friday going to public school and on Saturdays and Sundays we would come up to the Plano area for um, additional schooling on the weekends. And so it was very important to my parents that education was the number one priority. And so for me, um, you know, growing up, that's kind of been my calling. So. I actually attended Baylor University. I graduated there with my bachelor's as well as my master's, and I'm currently finishing up my PhD at UT Dallas with a focus in humanities. Eventually, I would like to go on to be a professor at the university level, and I really want to make sure that, you know, <laughs> the future generation gets a very good education. Unfortunately, I don't think that's really what's going on right now, but I do understand we probably will get into the topic of education later, so I'll talk about that a little bit more then. What really got me motivated into politics was really the grassroots. And a lot of it was with encouragement from people in Collin County as well as in Dallas, Tarrant, and Denton County. And a lot of us realized that really we, we, want, we want to get back to three major things. The first one is to get back to a limited constitutional government. Um, you know, the, the federal government has grown extensively way too large and we really want to make sure that at the state level we stand strong against them and that we stand up for our state's rights. The second one is to get back to fiscal responsibility. You know, not increasing our debt anymore, not increasing taxes. And then the last thing really is to just return power back to the American people because, you know, we are what makes this country great. 
Thank you. Terrific. Thanks so much. I didn't realize we have three Baylor Bears up here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, Matt. This case is too smart to run for <laughs> 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 Well, good evening, everybody. My name is uh, Matt Shaheen. I grew up in uh, Virginia. I actually came from a town that had more cattle than citizens, but we grew up in the Shenandoah Valley. And about uh, 20 years ago, I married my wife, Robin, and uh, we have three children, Celia, Abby, and Sam. And they're obviously a big delight uh, for me. I've been, uh, we, we moved down, I moved down to Texas in 1987, worked for uh, EDS, and spent 19 years in the technology industry, and uh, then got into politics. And uh, the past five years, I was on the Collin County Commissioner's Court. I uh, got a great record with respect to uh, fiscal conservatism, cutting taxes three times, reducing the budget. Made some really solid investments in technology to help uh, government run more, efficiency, uh, more efficient. We've actually paid down our county pension liability. And those are things we need to do in Austin. Our budget revenues grew 12% in the last biennial, yet we our budget dollars went up by like over 20%. 20%. We actually increased the budget uh, over 20%. And that includes attacking, uh, dipping into the rainy day fund. So what I'd like to do is take those fiscal conservative uh, experiences uh, to down in Austin. I also feel like the Republican Party really has a big decision in front of us. I mean, the failure of liberalism is all around us. If you look at the welfare state, obviously Obamacare is a big failure. Uh, that we got to keep pushing back with respect to trying to get that in, in Texas. But our state's under attack. The Obama administration and the liberals are trying to change our way of life. And they're trying to spread the misery of liberalism in Texas. So what the Republican Party needs to decide is, do we want to be a party of John McCain or do we want to be a party of Ted Cruz? What I want to offer you this evening is I'm the party of Ted Cruz and the conservative Republican ranks, and I'll help you join me. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you for those responses. And actually, your response is a good segue into our next question, which is uh, regarding labels. Um, based on what I can see from your campaign materials, two of you guys have labeled yourselves conservative Republicans. One of you has labeled yourself a liberty conservative. So, what I'd like to know is please explain what that label means to you and how do you qualify that for the voter. So, Stacy, if you would please answer that question first. So I consider myself a liberty conservative. Growing up, my values that were taught to me were very conservative. My parents immigrated here from Taiwan and they, you know, the, the Asian culture is extremely conservative. Um, you know, I, I would almost say a little bit more conservative than you know the Republican conservative. Um, so, so for me, I, that's something I grew up with and that's something that's very innate to me. But for me, I really understand that as an American, you know, not everybody is, grows up with conservative values and not everybody might necessarily agree with the values that I was brought up with. And so for me, it comes down to the idea of liberty and <coughs> what, the, what the purpose of government is. And for me, the role of government proper role is to preserve the life, liberty, and property of every single individual American. And so for me, as, as a liberty conservative, I see that as such. You know, even though my personal views are conservative, what I really want to do is I really want to go and serve on, on behalf of liberty for every single American. Thank you. Terrific. Okay. Matt, you pose the same question. Yeah, that's a really good question. I think we should all pause and uh, just take into consideration the fact that in a Republican primary, you have candidates that are trying to differentiate themselves and call themselves conservatives. In other words, in the Republican Party, there's confusion about are we a conservative party or are we not? And so that's what I was alluding to before is our, conser our Republican Party has a decision that it needs to make. Is it going to be conservative or is it not? And my value proposition, my proposal to you all is we need to be a conservative a Republican Party. So that's why I call that out. It's very clear now that our government is hurting individuals. Our government is hurting citizens. If you look at the failure of the welfare state and what's happened over the past 50 years, it's been devastating. If you look at the African American community, which has been targeted by liberals in the welfare state, over 70% of the little babies now that are born are born without a father. And over 40% don't make it out of the womb alive. That's what the welfare state's done. We have an overarching, overreaching government it's going after our liberties. We're going after our privacy. And so what conservatism means 
is having government that focuses on its core competency and leave the rest up to us. Leave, it up, leave the rest up to the free market. Respect the ninth and tenth amendments of our United States Constitution and limit the power and scope of government. And that's what it means to be conservative. Very good. Glenn? Conservative Republican means to me the, uh, the ideals really instilled by our founding fathers. Um, uh, life, liberty, and property. Stacy mentioned those three. Those are uh, ideas that were not only a part of our Constitution, but there are God-given rights as well. And our founding fathers very wisely incorporated those into the Constitution. And as Republicans, we must instill those in the way we govern. Um, ben Franklin was asked, when he was coming out of the Constitutional Convention uh, by someone standing there, what kind of government have you given us? And he responded, a republic, as if you can keep it. Not a democracy, but a republic. And the Republican Party, I think, it stands for and instills those types of principles and needs to continue to focus on those each and every day. I also think about conservative and sort of the root of that is conserve. That means we are to be stewards and caretakers of the resources given to us by the voters and the taxpayers, and we need to make sure we're being fiscally responsible in the way those resources are being used each and every day. Uh, <clears throat> limited government does not mean no government. It means a government that does a few things but does them well. And so issues like water, transportation, and education, those must be addressed by our government. We simply cannot just say no to those issues. We've got to find smart, workable solutions to them. And so for that reason, I think a conservative Republican holds dear to the conservative principles, but also fights hard to find solutions. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so some of the issues that you guys have talked about so far and things that you've mentioned, which leads me to my next question, which is, going if you're elected, going into the next legislature, what are your top three legislative priorities going into the next session? Matt, we'll start with you. Um, a couple things. One is, of course, um, um, we need to tackle the issue of illegal immigration because our federal government is falling short. That's a federal responsibility. But we've got 2,000 miles of our border uh, the federal government is failing to protect. So Texas is <coughs> spending in excess of $100 million uh, protecting our border, and we need to continue that. And there's some areas that we need to expand uh, with respect to the Ranger Recon team that was established several years ago. Um, and expanding their capabilities. They volunteer with um, a lot of volunteer, or they work with a lot of volunteer patrols, uh, and that's something that we could look forward to in expanding as well, as well as uh, camera surveillance and other surveillance technologies on our border. That's something that the state shouldn't have to step into, but we need to, and that needs to be a priority. In education, we need to look at more local control. I've talked to most of the members of our, um, our ISD, and uh, it, it be amazed at how much of the unfunded mandates that come, even from Austin. We talk about unfunded, unfunded mandates from uh, Washington, but Austin has a lot of unfunded mandates on our education uh, system. And uh, a lot of the trustees in our ISDs uh, have a desire to be able to control the calendar more, teacher pay uh, ratios, student to teacher ratios, those types of things. So a lot more uh, control as far as that. And then uh, one innovative thing that we've done in Collin County is with respect to uh, indigent health care. All the counties are mandated by the state of Texas to provide indigent health care. And what we've done, we've done something quite unique with respect to leveraging the private sector um, health care industry in Collin County. And we've totally revamped the way we do that. And I think this is the conservative way to address Obamacare. Not only do we need to push back and stop on Medicaid expansion and stop Obamacare from coming into the state of Texas, but we have a unique, um, innovative way to tackle um, health care for the needy that we've implemented in Collin County and I want to help take that statewide. Okay, terrific. Now, um, Glenn, you're next up to respond to that. What would your top three priorities be? Well, as I've already mentioned, I think infrastructure issues uh, must uh, be close to the top of the list. Uh, we've been under uh, stage three drought restrictions uh, for most of the last three or four years. If you saw the article in the Dallas Morning News uh, just a, a week ago Sunday, Lake Lebon is at less than 50% of its level. It's lower today than it was this time last year. If we don't get some significant rain, we're going to be uh, under a watering ban come this summer. And so that impacts not only uh, the quality of life, 
we enjoy now, but the ability to continue to grow and develop um, as, as an area. Uh, transportation infrastructure is right up there as a, a priority. Uh, we are choking on our own congestion. We're very blessed to live in a, a dynamic growing area, but as new people move to the area, we do not have enough money currently to maintain the roads that we have, much less build new infrastructure. So smart, effective management of our resources and stopping diversions uh, out of our transportation fund will help solve those issues. Uh, the proposition coming up next November on the ballot is a billion dollars, uh, which is a good start, but just a start in order to solve the issues. The Proposition 6 that passed last November uh, is an important start in dedicating $2 billion of funds towards water infrastructure, which is you know, just desperately needed for our area. Uh, education is another area that we uh, has already been discussed. Uh, Plano has been blessed to have a very strong public education system, and it needs to remain so. We need to not let the courts decide how education gets funded. That must be the responsibility of the legislature. Lastly, limited, accountable government. Um, our government needs to run efficiently. It needs to adopt best practices. All of our businesses have been faced in the last number of years uh, with the task of doing more with less. We need to make sure our government functions in the same way. We cannot have inefficiency uh, and hope to have the, the kind of results we need in our government. Thank you. Stacy. what would your top three priorities be? My first priority would be to nullify Obamacare, uh, really stand up for states' rights, I've spoken with a lot of residents in the district and that seems to be one of their top priorities is that they don't like the fact that they're, one, either forced to purchase something that they don't, they don't want to purchase, or second, that the fact that with the passage of Obamacare that their costs are increasing and they're being covered for things that they don't necessarily need. And so that would definitely be the first one. We definitely need to stand strong at the state and to practice our 10th Amendment rights. The second one would be to uh, focus on education Education has become very uh, centralized with its planning, and that's not serving our students. That's not serving our teachers who are trying to serve our students, and parents aren't very happy with what's going on either. Um, I think the, the, the way that we're trying to go about it really is to throw more money at it. Say, oh, we need to fund education because it's for the kids, it's for the students. But more funding isn't necessarily resulting in better education, in resulting in students who come out of school with critical thinking skills, with skills ready for the workforce. And so we really need to localize the control of it, allow teachers who are actually in the classrooms with the students the ability to work with their students because they know them best. Allow parents who are actually in the community sending their, their children to these institutions to, to have a say in what their children are learning and to actually be able to see you know, the results that they're hoping, they're hoping for by sending their children there. And then the last thing that I'd really want to address is the Second, second Amendment rights. I'm really uh, a proud supporter of the Second Amendment and I really want to want constitutional carry passed in Texas. It's, it's surprising that Texas, you know, being one of the reddest states, is actually not, you know, leading the way in this fight. And I definitely think we need to because, you know, we have a right to protect ourselves and, you know, I don't think that's something that we should, we should you know, throw away. So those are my three issues. Thank you. And I will tell you that based on your top three legislative priorities for all of you, we have more questions that are going to attack in this topic. So I <laughs> believe that. Um, so let's move on to uh, topic number four, which is the budget. Um, I vowed when I put these questions together, I would just make them open-ended and not leading at all. So I'm just going to pitch it out there. And Glenn, this is for you first. <clears throat> What did you think of last, the last legislature's budget? And what, if anything, would you have done differently? Or would you do differently? Let's put it that way. Kind of if you're king, so to speak. But please address what, you, what they did in the legislature in the budget. Well, fortunately, in the state of Texas, uh, by our Constitution, we are required to have a balanced budget. Uh, and, and just like our family lives within its means, our state is required to do that as well. We're also fortunate that we have a pretty dynamic and expanding economy that has allowed us, and smartly so, to put away funds in a, a rainy day fund to use for unexpected expenses, and that's kind of what our family does too. So, so I was glad to see that the, the legislature was able to come together, was able to address some, some priority issues in the budget, was able to restore some of the funding that had been cut out of public education, which was needed to uh, make sure that we're maintaining the quality of that education. I agree that money is not always the answer. I think our school districts have to also adopt those types of best practices that businesses adopt to make sure that they're all operating as efficiently 
not only in our region but across our state. So, so I was glad glad for those things. I was very pleased to see uh, the legislature move to uh, put Proposition Six on the ballot, so that and the voters overwhelmingly passed the Proposition Six, which was the water funding, the two billion dollar funding that I mentioned earlier, because that is such a, a critical need. Um, otherwise, uh, as it relates to budgeting going forward, what I mentioned earlier, I think, is, is still very much the case. We need to look at all areas of our government and how it's operated to make sure it's operating efficiently, make sure that technology is being used to, to get the most results without with the least amount of money. I noticed just recently uh, when we're filing our campaign finance reports, we have a technology system that allows them to do this electronically, but it's using technology that was probably written at least 20 years ago. To say that it's not user friendly is a huge understatement. I see that as it relates to candidates running for office. I can only imagine how many other individuals, taxpayers, and businesses are faced with the same type of frustration when they're trying to interact with our government and trying to eliminate that kind of waste and inefficiency is very important. Okay, Stacy, you're next. Up. What did you think of the legislature's job with the budget? So I understand the state legislature has a very difficult job in figuring out where all the funding goes. What I was not a fan of was the increase in the budget. I think that there is, you know, a lot of a lot of issues need to be funded and a lot of areas need to be funded. But what we need to focus on instead of increasing the budget for all of these areas is to cut the budget in areas that it's not necessary. So we have a lot of state-run departments and um, agencies that, you know, are outdated and probably need to be addressed. And, you know, if it's not necessary, we should take a look at that. And if they're, you know, not necessary, we can actually get rid of that and save that money from, you know, that specific agency or administration and spend it elsewhere where, you know, we, we feel that it needs to be spent. Um, in regards to tapping into the rainy day fund for water, I believe that we do have enough funding, you know, within our budget to pay for water, and I don't feel that we actually needed to tap into the rainy day fund for it. I think that really needs to be saved for specific statewide emergencies, and you know, we are we are slowly going in that direction, but we haven't gotten to that point yet, is what what I believe. Um, so, you know, really, it's it is a difficult job. Um, you know, it is important to keep a balanced budget. You know, all of us individually are able, hopefully, to do that. At, you know, in our in our individual. Um, lives, but you know, I, that's pretty much how I thought about the, the state. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Shaheen. Uh, I was disappointed in the um, in the budget process. The uh, what was set out by the Speaker of the House was he said was water, transportation, and education were the priorities of the legislative session, and only one of those got uh, funded during the regular session. So it's either a priority or it's not a priority. Texas gets X amount of dollars. We have $200 billion biannual that we receive. Half of that, by the way, is from the federal government, which is pretty concerning. And that, nevertheless, that's the dollars that we have to work with. And what we ended up doing is having to go into special session after special se session to get these items funded. And that's not the way it should work. What we need to do is, what are our priorities? You fund those first. I would add criminal justice to the three that I already, I already mentioned. And then the dollars that are left over are what are, what are uh, allocated. I mean, how we funded $24 million for Hollywood to make movies in the state of Texas before we funded education is beyond me. So I guess I have a little bit more to learn on how the legislative session works. But what we need to do is find out what our priorities are, fund those, and then what the dollars are that are left over, we make those decisions, and that's the approach. Okay, great. Uh, <clears throat> I have a, a moment just to respond to Stacey's uh, comment there. Answer regarding the uh, Proposition 6 use of funds out of the rainy day fund. Well, I tell you what I will do. I'm going to ask everybody a follow up question. You have one minute for that, so squeeze it into that. And here's my follow up question. So here's my follow up question to each one of you, starting with Glenn. Do you favor zero balanced budgeting? Zero Absolutely. Based. Zero, I'm sorry, zero based, zero based budgeting. Based. Yes, uh, it's something that I implemented in our firm when I've been running the firm over the last eight years. I believe that the worst thing you can do is get a bureaucracy uh, a budget and say, now how much do you want to grow that budget? They should have to come back each cycle and justify why they're spending those dollars and how they're being spent. So, so I do think zero-based budgeting is an important tool that must be used at the state level. With respect to the $2 million uh, used in the rainy day fund, that is a revolving fund. It's providing very valuable water infrastructure without which the cost to our economy would be devastating. If you think about the, the fact that you choke off new businesses and you 
have such an impact on quality of life. The, the, the inability to access those funds, which are taxpayer funds, um, is, is simply not advisable. I think those rainy day funds, even though ironically named, certainly should be used for something as critical as water supply. <laughs> okay. Um, Stacy, uh, same question to you. Do you favor zero-based budgeting? Yes, I do favor zero-based budgeting. A lot of, you know, similar similar things that Glenn said, I completely agree with. You know, if there's agencies that are, you know, coming for budgeting, they need to be able to say how much they need, why they need it, and be, uh, and be able to show that that's where it's being spent. Um, in response to the, the water budgeting um, for Prop 6, I believe that there are other ways that we could have addressed the water issue other than, you know, by spending more out of our rainy day fund. I think one of the options that wasn't quite considered was the idea of dredging the lakes and the um, aquifers that we have for the sediment at the bottom, which, because a lot of our, our, our lakes, they're not actually being used to its full capacity. So by creating more, eventually it's still going to be, you know, as, as rain falls, as sediment goes into it, the capacity of the water that it can retain is still going to continue to decrease. So by creating more, it's, it's, you're just kind of pushing it down, like the same issue down the line. That's a good point. They do that at White Rock Lake all the time. <laughs> and it gets filled up. Okay, so Matt, same question. Zero-based budgeting. Yeah, I mean, zero-based budgeting is um, it's a no-brainer. It's what the private sector does. You don't automatically do a budget. So that just doesn't make sense. But we really need to go beyond that. I mean, one of the things that we did at Collin County is we required return on investments for the taxpayer dollars that were invested in certain projects. And, and we really need to go beyond zero-based budgeting. That should be the starting point. We really need to say, go to the citizens and say, we've spent X amount of dollars. Here's the return on investment that you're getting for that money, and that's not really not done today. And that that's why you, you, when you look at the state budget, you see a lot of silliness or lack of efficiencies. For example, the state of Texas has multiple IT departments, has multiple purchasing departments, and all those should be centralized. You know, Austin wants to centralize all their power down in Austin, but when it comes to their own shit, they want to have multiple departments. But you know, it's those types of things that we really need to look at. So beyond zero-based budgeting, that's pretty much a no-brainer. No Let's require a return on investment for our taxpayer dollars. That's a good point. That's a good point. Okay, next subject. Stacy. I'm glad you are getting this question first. Um, you seem very tuned into this, uh, which is in limiting uh, state government. Can you name three state departments that you would eliminate? The first state department I would like to eliminate is the North Texas Tollway Association. Um, you know, I'm not a fan of public and private partnerships, so, um, you know, that's definitely one of them I would like to get rid of. Uh, the second one, it's not exactly, I guess, a state um, one, but the Texas, uh, oh, I'm sorry, the Transportation Security Administration that we are, you know, that we, we do have to have in the state of Texas because of federal um, reasons. And um, there's the last one. There is actually it's pretty interesting because of, um, there's a uh, there's a whole entire list. Whenever I was looking up of all of the agencies that you know Texas funds publicly, and there was one of them. Whenever I was looking it up a while ago, which was the Emancipation Juneteenth um, Association or something. And when I had first looked it up about maybe a month ago, it had shown that this organization was still being funded. And then recent, only recently when I went back to look at it, did it say that it was actually dissolved back in 2011. So obviously whoever is updating this is not doing their job correctly. So perhaps maybe we need to dissolve that, that group as well. And maybe, you know, allow, allow you know, a, a privatized company who knows how to update their website <laughs> to run it instead. So those would be my thing. Great, all right, Matt, what are your ideas? What departments or agencies would you cut? I got a couple dozen. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of the limited to three. Um, yeah, I referred to it earlier. I mean, there are there are multiple um, overhead departments in the state. Those can be consolidated. I mean, it would save millions of dollars from an IT perspective. You got literally different purchasing departments that have different IT systems. I mean, it's just ridiculous. So literally, when you look across the state, there's literally dozens. Not, I think we're thinking. Uh, um, Health and Human Services or those types of things, and I would look at it a little bit differently. What I would do is, as part of the sunset process that the state has established today, what type of consolidation efforts, um, opportunities rather, are there uh, within the process? I would make that part of it. And I'm not joking. There are literally dozens of departments within the state uh, budget that can be reduced or taken out. Right? Okay. Go ahead. 
Matt mentioned the sunset review process that we have. That's a, a, a set process that our state has to systematically go by uh, each you know, department and commission uh, on a regular basis and look at what they do, how they do it, and whether or not they should be renewed. And, and I get the feeling that bureaucracies, being bureaucracies, which typically are all about perpetuating themselves, that process has not been nearly as rigorous as it needs to be in eliminating the waste and, and making sure those agencies uh, and departments are running as efficiently as they, they should. Uh, a perfect example, and one that I think deserves a great deal of scrutiny, is TxDOT, Texas Department of Transportation. I mean, transportation is a huge issue, and we can't eliminate that department, but we need to make sure that it is operating in a way that's both effective and efficient in addressing the needs of, of uh, the citizens of Texas. You know, I don't know about you, but when I'm on Texas highways, I don't always get the sense that that's good for the case, and, and so that's an area where I can need some immediate scrutiny. Um, licensing and regulation. I uh, was out walking neighborhoods uh, just last weekend and, and came across a small businessman who's in the pool repair business, and he was talking about how just recently Texas has decided to regulate pool repairs, and it was killing his business because what was happening is there were these bureaucrats in Austin out of touch with the way this really happens, and they were putting these large fees and expenses and unreasonable regulations on the way he was operating his business, and it was pushing him out of business, and I think that's what happens so often when you have governmental regulation that's out of touch as to what happens really in our communities. Um, and lastly, you know, the, the, the one that, that just always confuses me is the Railroad Commission. You know, they, they regulate our energy, but, you know, one, I think they are going to finally get the name updated so it actually you know, relates to what they do. But again, here's an area where we need to make sure that the state agencies and commissions are actually addressing the issues that impact the citizens and the businesses. Terrific, thank you. Okay, so now, Matt, this, you're going to start on this next one. So our next topic is taxation. Um, and kind of broadly, within the state of Texas, what would be your preferred system of taxation? Or I guess maybe in another way, based on what we have now, what would you like to see revised? What would be a more fair means of taxation within the state? Uh, within the state? And then the <coughs> second question to that would be, would you take a pledge to not raise taxes? I've already taken that pledge. Um, as far as our, the uh, taxation, if you look at the biennial um, revenues for the state of Texas, it's about $208 billion. And I was alluding to earlier, about $96 billion of that is, um, is taxes. I mean, one change that we need to make right now is get rid of the margins tax. That was passed in a, here, here. a special session. Um, I really challenge the validity of whether that's constitutional or not in Texas. At a minimum, it's against the spirit of, of, uh, of the Texas Constitution. But we could phase that out. It, it, it only represents about $2.6 billion of revenues for the state of Texas, so it's actually not that much. It's about 3% of our revenues. So I would phase that out. That would be a big change that I would, uh, that I would uh, propose. Okay, great. All right. Um, Glenn, you are next up to tackle that issue of taxation. But I think Texas's uh, system of taxation is, is overly complicated and, and not always fair and equitable in the way that it's applied. I think uh, I agree uh, with Matt that the uh, Texas franchise tax, also known as the margin tax, has been um, a, a big mess. Uh, it, it came out of the, the 2006 special session trying to deal with, once again, a lawsuit to, to come up with a, a better way to fund public education. And I heard several folks refer to it um, as an idea that was half-baked. And it seems like as it's been implemented and how sort of unfair and unequally it's applied across businesses, that's absolutely the case. I've actually been down in Austin last several sessions trying uh, to work with members to address inequalities that are baked into uh, the Texas franchise tax and, and, and eliminating it would, would be you know, probably a good solution. Um, as for the tax pledge, um, my position is that if you can eliminate taxes or reform the tax system that allows us to have a fair, broader-based system that still would allow the state to meet its revenue needs, because there are needs, because I do believe that, that limited government is not the same as no government, and, and things like public safety, like transportation, like education are areas where the state does need to provide revenue. Um, you need to understand the best and most fair way to raise those revenues. And so by taking a pledge that says, I will not raise taxes before I know all the facts and the circumstances that might cause some tax to increase, but three other taxes to be eliminated or go away, 
is an unwise thing for somebody who's in a governing role to do. So I would not sign such a pledge. Okay. Stacy, taxation, would you take a pledge? Yes, I've also already taken that pledge that I would not vote to increase taxes. Um, as a, I guess as to answer the question on taxation, um, I definitely agree that we need to get rid of the franchise and margins tax with both of them. And the other tax I'd actually like to get rid of is the property tax. Um, a lot of people, you know, if you have a right to your life, liberty, and property, then why in the world are you still renting your land and your property from the government? So, that, you know, that's how I feel about the property tax. Um, I, I'm very glad that Texas does not have an income tax. Um, you know, I am a teaching assistant, so my salary is not very high, so I'm extremely glad that we don't have a, t a Texas income tax. And, you know, for me, I think the fair way of, of um, raising funds for state use would be the consumption tax. Um, I think that way, you know, across the board, as long as you're purchasing something, you know, you're part of that that purchase is going to fund um, state state requirements and state needs. Thank you. Okay. No, that's good. And, and you mentioning the property tax, that was one of my follow-up questions, was about property taxes. And um, I know we've seen different referendums, different things on the ballots to eliminate taxes for veterans, eliminate property taxes for disabled people, eliminate property. And so, and I guess now, I mean, that list is growing. Um, so again, back to being fair and balanced, um, and Stacey, to your point about renting your property from the government. So my follow-up question was, what's your view on that? Uh, and I guess we're going back to Matt to start that um, on eliminating the property tax so that you actually have ownership. Yeah, I mean, it sounds great. The problem is, is if you go to counties where it, the, the assumption is you replace the property tax with the sales tax, the challenge you have is the math doesn't really work well for smaller counties, so they don't have a really big retail base. <clears throat> so what happens if you, is you have insufficient funding for your criminal justice systems, your schools, those types of things. So it, it sounds like a great idea to abolish the property tax and go to the sales tax. The problem is the numbers just don't work, and what you'll end up doing is introducing something like we have with Robin Hood, where then the state's going to get in and start collecting everybody's revenues, and we're going to redistribute them, and that's going to be a mess. People that are part of the Plano ISD you know that we've lost over a billion dollars in, in recapture. So what I what I would recommend is with the property tax, I think we need to pressure our local um, elected officials to spend wisely and lower their taxes. Let's all of us lean on the county commissioners or the ISDs or the city councils. If we want property tax relief, uh, let's lean on those local governing bodies and get tax reliefs that way. Uh, you know, having Austin cut other people's taxes and then getting the credit, I'm not sure that's the wisest thing to do either. But uh, so anyway, that's my point. That's my and, and like Matt, I do agree that uh, while it would be nice to say, oh, we don't have to pay property taxes anymore, it's simply not a workable solution. You can imagine uh, without having property taxes, sales taxes on items could be as much as 30%. So not only does that math not work for areas that don't have a strong sales tax base, it would significantly <coughs> impact consumption, retailers, and, and those who produce those goods and services uh, in our state. And so I, I, I think there's a, a real problem in just saying, well, let's just get rid of the property tax because it's not a, a, a workable or a feasible uh, solution. But thinking broad-mindedly about how can we make sure we have a fair and broad-based system uh, that, that allows individuals to pay the least amount of tax. I mean, we're so fortunate in Texas not to have uh, uh, a state income tax, and, and it should always and must always remain that way. And I'm absolutely committed to that. That's that's one pledge that I would take uh, that, that we should never have any kind of state income tax uh, on individual or corporate level. And the um, uh, the franchise tax really is a, essentially a disguised income tax for corporations. I'm going to take a point of privilege. I'm going to needle you guys one more time on this property tax thing. <laughs> How about? allowing the property tax to be eliminated once you pay off your underlying mortgage or lien on the property. Would you phase out property tax for someone in that situation once they paid off their property? And then at a later point in time, if the property is sold to another buyer, that you could reinstitute property taxes on the property? What's the rules? Do I start? Ten, ten seconds. Ten seconds. Follow up. Here. This is a quick hit question. Ten seconds? Well, just something. Just quick. What do you think about that? Well, 
you know, I, conceptually. I, I'm open to anything conceptually. I'd, I'd have to really see what the what the numbers are. At, at the end of the day, um, I'm for as much tax relief as humanly possible. I've got the record to stand up on that. But at the end of the day, we do have a criminal justice system to run. We have law enforcement to provide. We have jails to put the bad guys in, and um, city council with its uh, sewage and, and so forth. So, uh, you know, I'd have to look at the numbers. Okay, so okay. It sounds like a great idea. But I got it. I got it. Okay. Well, uh, you know, my thought on that is I'm not sure how it worked from the commercial perspective. Uh, because, you know, as much as all of us as homeowners would like to say, you know, as soon as I get my home paid off, I don't have to pay taxes anymore. Um, I can see commercial property owners who I work with on a daily basis saying, oh, well, let's just disguise our debt as equity. That's a good so point. That I, I, I meant primarily for residential, and, for residents. And, but we have a cost, yeah. you know, and a problem if you split the tax roll. You can't really split the tax roll between residential and commercial uh, because then you start shifting that burden and all of a sudden you're saying oh we're doing this great favor for homeowners but as you're shifting that burden to commercial owners then you start impacting jobs and economic development isn't the burden already shifted to property owners now <laughs> to commercial property owners <laughs> well, anyway, okay all right okay good enough good enough let's move on all right so now oh, no, i assume that you're all for that <laughs> that should be an emphatic yes <laughs> suddenly get rid of, getting rid of it all together at one point in time. I obviously understand that it is something that needs to be phased out. It's not, most things, most change doesn't come overnight, and if it does, you know, everybody freaks out. So it's definitely something that needs to be phased out, but definitely I am an emphatic yes on that. Yes, um, so. Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, so now we're back to Glenn. Like I said, on your legislative priorities, we come back full circle. So now we are, we're on the topic of health care. Uh, what is your position on the Affordable Care Act? Uh, and this is an interesting one for you um, as an attorney. Did the Supreme Court rule properly in its review of this law? The Affordable Health Care Act is a train wreck. It is a <laughs> job killing, you know, uh, legislative scheme uh, that is just bad for our country, and it's bad for our state, it's bad for individuals, and it's bad for employers. To answer your question, uh, Chief Justice uh, Roberts got it wrong. Um, he was applying uh, a principle under uh, the Commerce Clause to validate uh, the Health Care Act and come up with a reason why it wasn't unconstitutional. And, and I clearly think, as it relates um, to the Tenth Amendment and, and the, the overreach of the federal government, that they simply got it wrong. Uh, the Affordable Care Act should have never been upheld by the Supreme Court, and we shouldn't be living under the burden that we have today. I mean, as, as somebody who's run a business with 200 employers, I can tell you it's causing us to have to reduce benefits and increase costs to all of our employees. And, that's, and, and, and there's nothing affordable or right about that. And then it's causing healthcare institutions uh, <coughs> to increase the quality of care. And, and for all the issues that we have in healthcare, which there are a number that need to be resolved, um, we still have the finest healthcare delivery system in the world, and it needs to remain so. Okay, all right, Stacy. I mentioned at the beginning that Obamacare is one of the issues that I'd want to nullify in the state of Texas, make sure that it's not implemented. Um, I know that there were some good selling points on the idea of affordable health care. Um, one of them was the idea that you know insurance companies would have to cover you if you had pre-existing conditions. And I know that's you know something that a lot of people with pre-existing conditions really like. But the problem with the, the Affordable Health Care Act was that yeah, exactly it's not affordable. And you know, a lot of employers that have um, that have a lot of um, employees, they had to either cut their hours so that they wouldn't have to provide for that or, you know, basically, you know, find other ways around it. Um, what I really want to do is I want to get government out of health care. I don't think, you know, I, for me, the, the Health Care Act was basically a bailout for the health care in, insurance industry, requiring everybody by law to have to purchase something whether you wanted to purchase it or not. Um, so really, I, I, I think health care should be between, you know, a doctor and the patient and the patient's family. I don't think anybody else should be involved. I don't think we need to go poking our noses into, you know, whatever else somebody else is doing and what your health issue is and, you know, whether it's something that, you know, I need to be, as, as, as somebody in government, needs to be, you know, informed about. You know, it's, it's something that's personal between a doctor and their patient. That's who it should be. They should have that confidentiality. So for me, you know, get government out of health care. 
The uh, Affordable Care Act is another example of the federal government hurting people. Five million people have lost their insurance. For those that are paying the premiums, your premiums have, have gone up. I mean, it's more than a train wreck. I mean, it's, it's, it's a really sad reflection on uh, the destruction of socialism and what it does to people. There are people out there today that are hurting because of that, that act. But what we need to do as conservatives is we need to come up with what's our alternative, right? And one of the things that we need to do is we need to start stop looking at insurance as a metric. Who has insurance? Who has insurance? That's a really bad metric. Because it implies that if you don't have insurance, you don't get health care, and that's not true. If you look at the nonprofit community, if you look at the uh, benevolence of our local churches, if you look at the donations of our medical society, if you look at uh, what counties are responsible for, people do get health care even if they don't have insurance. We've done some very innovative things here in Collin County. It's called Project Access. And I've been working with the Texas Public Policy Foundation over the past six months to craft legislation that will be an alternative to Obamacare in the state of Texas. And it'll be another example where Texas is another great example to the nation as far as how things should be done. And what it does is it creates an incentive for doctors to donate their time like they do here in Collin County. And I've talked to you know, dozens of doctors and the medical society, I've talked to the um, hospitals. Doctors cannot stand working with the federal government when it comes to Medicaid, Medicare. The accounting, the paperwork is just a nightmare. What they would love to do is just have the op option to opt out of that. Don't even mess with Medicaid, Medicare. Don't mess with the federal government. They'll just donate their time and, and empower counties to either uh, provide tax relief for doctors that participate or help with the retirement or you know, we'll just provide that flexibility. But we have a real opportunity in the state of Texas to show the conservative alternative to Obamacare and that's in process right now. Okay, great. And that actually is a good segue into my follow-up question on this topic, which uh, I guess is twofold. What legislation would you propose to in the state of Texas to either defeat Obamacare reduce the, the negative impacts of it or to provide alternatives for means of delivering health care in the state of Texas. So Matt, you'll get an additional minute to kind of follow up on that, but Glenn, we'll go back to you and let you answer that. You bet. Um, obviously, Obamacare and the ACA is a federal program, and so, so as much as we want to say we don't like it, we don't want it, um, it's the feds that are forcing it on us. I was so happy to see that uh, the Texas legislature um, and, and led by the governor refused to expand uh, the Medicaid roles in Texas because that would have been a permanent expansion of, of a number of people without necessarily the funding uh, to, to take care of that. That said, um, Texas has the highest uninsured rate in the, the nation and they show up in our emergency rooms like Baylor Plano, like THR you know, President Plano, like the Medical Center of Plano, and that's the most costly, least effective way to treat those folks. Meanwhile, the federal government is keeping $5 billion of our tax dollars because we refuse to play their game. And so, so one of the proposals is to really push the federal government to give us the block grants so we can have access to our tax dollars that we have paid so we can take care of the people that are presenting themselves with the medical issues and trying to provide wellness care and not just sick care. Uh, one of the programs that uh, that Baylor has done down in the Dallas area is the Juanita J. Kraft Diabetes and Wellness Center. Diabetes is a chronic disease that creates all sorts of complications that are very costly to treat. By providing this wellness center training, you know, center in uh, a wide area of Dallas, uh, Baylor has seen a dramatic decrease in the number of people presenting in their emergency room with those complications of diabetes and as a result has really cut the cost that they've had uh, to deliver that sort of indigent care. I agree with Matt. I think providing indigent care is something that our healthcare institutions and doctors feel very good about doing, but there, there's not enough of that to be able to care for all the needs that we have out there. And so we've got to have a more comprehensive approach and having these kind of block grants will allow us to do that. Okay, Stacy, let's move to you. Um, same question, what would you propose to reduce the impacts, eliminate alternatives, et cetera? Well, really it's just, you know, practicing our 10th Amendment right. Um, Alabama was, I believe, the first state who nullified, to nullify Obamacare. 
basically saying that any federal agency or a person working for the federal government who tried to come into their state to implement it would actually be breaking state law. And I think that's definitely something that Texas, we can follow suit. I'm actually surprised we weren't, you know, the first ones to do that. Um, but really, it's it's about getting, getting you know, government out of the healthcare industry. You know, a lot of there's been a few um, doctors in other states have that who have decided that they're not even going to accept um, healthcare insurance anymore. They're just going to it's basically going to be that the patient comes in, they're going to pay what it costs to you know for the doctor to see them, and that's it. You don't have to fill out any forms. You don't have to you know pay a deductible things like that and go through all that difficult process just to you know for some just to go and see the doctor for a simple checkup. So you know really it's just about getting government out of healthcare. Okay. All right, Matt, one more minute to follow up on. I think overall we need to look at ways to phase out the federal government's involvement instead of uh, expand it. And I talked about Project Access. Project Access has actually addressed some of the issues with respect to the energy going straight to the emergency room. What Project Access does is they establish a relationship with their doctor, the general practitioner, and then if it's discovered that they need specialization, those types of stuff, those types of things, we have specialists that are um, uh, in the Project Access um, partnership as well. We actually have excess capacity uh, with Project Access in Collin County. Um, so I think it does uh, tackle the energy and health care need in Collin County. Now not every county in the state of Texas is like, like Collin. We're, they're not all blessed uh, like we are. Uh, that's why I want to empower um, county commissioners courts the power to provide incentives to doctors. So like if you look at the border counties and some of the other um, poorer counties that there's an economic incentive uh, for these doctors, but I, I got to tell you quite frankly, I'm not sure they would need that. I think just uh, they want to give back to the community and give uh, you know return to the community and help those that are need. I think that's why their doctors would be enough. Okay. <clears throat> so on the topic of Obamacare, we talked a lot about getting the federal government out of things, correct? <clears throat> so, which leads me to our next topic, which is federal power and states' rights. Um, in your opinion, is the federal government operating constitutionally? If not, how would you propose to protect the citizens of Texas from federal abuses? Things like executive orders and bureaucracies and judicial fiat, etc. So, um, Stacy, you, you're the first one to get to beat, the, beat that drum again. <laughs> Tell us about how we get these guys out of our hair. Well, for one, we need to start standing up. I think a lot of the, the reasons that the federal government has you know, really overreach their powers and have really earned up a lot of it is because, you know, at the state level, we're allowing them to do that. And we're, you know, we've, always, we've almost become complacent and it's become very normal for, you know, the federal government to do something. And we, you know, we sit here and we say, oh, you know, you act actually constitutionally, you're not allowed to do that. But other than kind of maybe, you know, tweeting about it, arguing on Facebook with other people or, you know, writing in our blog that, you know, only our, our friends and family see, we actually need to mobilize uh, physically to, you know, write, write the senators who are down there, write the congressmen who are down there, who are voting on things like that and taking away your rights, and who are, you know, breaking their oath to the, the oath that they took to protect the Constitution. You know, they're not hearing from us enough, and they're thinking, well, you know, I've been here long enough, you're going to vote for me, you know, to reelect me to come back here, and, you know, it, it really doesn't matter what, the, what us as the people in the state say or do anymore. So really, you know, we need to get louder, and you know, we need to start start having people run against them. You know, or if you know if they're doing something wrong, they're voting wrong. You need to let them know about it. Um, but really, we we there's a lot of things that at the state level, you know, we really need to stand up against the federal level, and you know, for one, start nullifying things that you know they're trying to implement at the state level that they're not allowed to do. We can do that, and we should. So. Okay. Um, this time, Matt. This is a huge concern. We have a president that's taking unilateral action, uh, which is just amazing. Just unilaterally making changes to the Obamacare law and bypassing Congress. A clear violation of the balance of powers that's established in our, in our Congress. Uh, and that's a concern. The, um, what a state can do is we can do things to protect our citizens from the violations of privacy that have occurred. I mean, it is amazing if you think about the invasion of privacy, how the IRS has been used to target conservatives I mean, in the United States, the actions of the NSA. Uh, so we can pass legislation here locally to protect citizens if you have federal employees that are using, using the power of the federal government. 
uh, but those employees have to reside in the state of Texas for those to apply. This is something that is, is beyond legislation. Uh, it's really going to take the citizens of the United States to see the failures of Obamacare, to see the failures of the welfare state, to see how the federal government is intruding in our lives and actually taking away our rights and invading, invading our privacy. It's, it, it's, there's not a legislative answer to this. It's us and it's in the confines of the, of the U.S. Constitution. And the U.S. Constitution does have provisions to address these types of matters. Go ahead. You know, I, I think the overreaching uh, by the federal government is just you know, awful and it must stop. Obama has recently said, I've got a pen. What he means by that is that he has used his pen for executive orders, for recess appointments, if you look at what's happened in the U.S. Senate by them uh, doing away with the long-standing tradition uh, of having uh, the supermajority to approve presidential appointments, uh, these types of things really are undermining uh, the, the very core of the Ninth and the Tenth Amendment in our Constitution, which says that there are certain powers enumerated in the Constitution which belong to the federal government, and those which are not specifically enumerated in the Constitution of the federal government and not prohibited to the states belong to the states. And so when the government does stuff like overreaches, relies on the Commerce Clause, pushes Obamacare to us, it erodes that very uh, constitutional structure that our founding fathers put in place and has worked so well for us for the last 237 years. Uh, when I had my comments earlier about Ben Franklin, he asked, you know, you know what kind of you know, government are you giving us? The Republic, if you can keep it, this is the if you can keep it part, and it really is up to we, the people, to make sure that our elected officials in Washington are hearing from us to uphold those tenets of the Constitution that have been so important in giving us the life and the liberty and the property that we enjoy under our Constitution. Um, if the federal government's not doing their job, then we must, as, as a state, stand up, and thank goodness for people like Attorney General Abbott, who regularly makes it his job to sue the government to stop that kind of overreaching thing when it is happening on such a regular basis. Okay, and I have a follow-up question that, <clears throat> in terms of order, Stacy, I'm going to go back to you first, but this is one that I think you already agree with, but I'm still going to give you the minute, because I want to hear from these other two guys, and that is specifically about the topic of state nullification or state interposition. Is it a valid legal construct as a remedy for states to counteract federal abuses of power and unconstitutional actions? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I actually did also want to mention, even sometimes at the state level, we can get it wrong. So, you know, it's not always just at the state level that you can nullify. You know, we, we, you know, a lot of people have probably been called to jury duty before, and that's actually somewhere where you can practice nullification as well. If there's a state law that's unjust, or a state law that, you know, really shouldn't be a law, you as a jury can practice jury nullification. So, keep that in mind. Okay, let's see. Um, Matt? Um, nullification sounds great. The problem is when carries through as a process that we end up losing. So it, 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 it sounds good. There's, there, there's several issues with nullification. I, I think what we're talking about here is how do we address the overreach of the federal, federal government? And again, nullification is one idea, but it, as it plays out, it tends, we tend not to uh, achieve what we're looking for. I've been waiting three decades for the Republican Party to do what it says it's going to be doing as far as controlling spending, our debt, and it just hasn't done it. And so, you know, sending letters to senators or congressmen or calling them and all that type of thing, I just, that's not going to do it. We really need for our nation to stand up and rise and within the confines of our Constitution make changes that way. That's why there's people that are looking at um, a convention of the states and actually make amendments to the Constitution that way. I think we as conservatives need to start looking outside the confines of the Republicans that are in Washington, the Democrats that are, that are in uh, Washington, and really look to the Constitution as far as these changes. We've all been t talking about this for the past three decades, and we're not there. We keep sending people into Washington, it says a conservative, they get to Washington, and they bail on us after a couple of years. So it really needs, within the confines of the Constitution, a better way to address this. Yeah. Okay, all right. Glenn? 
your thoughts on nullification? And, and I'll, I'll agree with Matt, but I think in concept nullification sounds good. In practice, I think it's much more problematic. And, and you know, first and foremost, we are Americans of the United States of America, and we need to make sure we maintain that. We need to you know, operate under the rule of law, and, and, and while it's not perfect, and our court systems certainly have their, their problems, using sort of the, uh, uh, the, the lawsuits and the tactics that uh, our Attorney General has used here in Texas to try to combat this overreaching, I think is, is the proper way to, to address those issues and continuing to hold our elected officials in Washington accountable to make sure that they're making the kind of decisions that are consistent with our Constitution. Okay. Just a quick one. Okay, yeah, I've, I've also had another comment, so <laughs> I'll let you make one. Go ahead. Um, I did just want to, you know, a lot of things in concepts sound great and in practice are very difficult, which, you know, completely understand a lot of its, you know, theories as well. Um, but I did want to mention, you know, in, in terms of nullification, the problem is a lot of people, too many people think that way. And so they're scared to, to practice, they're to, you know, practice it because they think, oh, you know, not, a, not enough people perhaps agree with me that this is something that we need to do. But I think, you know, in terms of following the Constitution, if they're not following the Constitution, that's, I think, where the problem with having a constitu constitutional convention or, you know, adding additional liberty amendments um, comes into play because if people that we're electing into office are not following the Constitution already, what makes them suddenly decide that they're going to follow it if, you know, additional better amendments are, are added in there? So the problem really is the people that we're electing into office, perhaps. They, yes. they, they aren't following the principles. They aren't following what their oath of office is. And so that's extremely problematic. That's a whole different well, no, no, that's that's whole And that's a good comment because my mind was to follow it up. And, I, and, I, and I've heard more than just you two guys say, oh, well, that won't work. It sounds good, but it won't work. Well, uh, the question I always come to is why? What's the Ninth and Tenth Amendment for? Mm -hmm. If the state won't step up and exercise its right to protect the citizens using its current constitutional authority, Stacy, to your point, let's pass some new amendments. Well, what good will that do? I'm saying let's use the ones we've got. So I'd like to spin the wheel and see how nullification works out. So anyway, that's just me. So anyway, all right, we've got to move on. All right, so on education, uh, Matt, this is for you. Okay, so uh, assessment of current education system, okay, what's good, what's bad, and what changes would you promote? Um, in, in this area, we're blessed. I mean, our, our graduation rates, our completion rates are about 96, 97 percent. Plano ISD has about a $500 million budget for 55,000 uh, students, and we got some great football stadiums in this, in this area as well. Um, I, I alluded, alluded to it earlier, when I've talked to the ISD trustees, they really have an issue with local control. There's a lot of things that are mandated down by Austin that really should be uh, left up to our ISDs where you and I can interface with them on a daily basis. And really, so a lot of it has to do with uh, local control. Uh, funding is a significant issue with uh, schools. Again, talking about Plano ISD, and I want to be respectful for our far north Dallas contingent that is uh, part of the district as well. But the fact is, Plano has donated or given back to recapture over a billion dollars. Now that amount is, is decreasing and has been in excess of 100, uh, 100 million dollars. It's more than the 30 million dollar uh, range now. But the state needs to look at things like when we talk about funding per student, we really need to look, also take a look um, at the cost of living uh, across the state of Texas, right? Because the cost, cost of living is different in Dallas than it is out in East Texas. We need to make that part of the equation. We also need to take a look at consolidating our ISDs. If you look, if you travel out to East Texas, you have an ISD of uh, 4,000 people and its population right next to another ISD that might be 10,000. Do you really need two ISDs? So there's a lot of reform that could be made from an education perspective um, to improve our education. But first and foremost, is what I'm hearing from our ISD trustees is local control. Okay, great. Glenn, can you tackle that for us? Uh, absolutely. Um, and, you know, we are very blessed in our district to have a wonderful public school system in the Plano ISD. They do a great job. Both of our kids, uh, Will and Abby, uh, graduated from Plano West Senior High, and, and even my wife went all the way through 12th grades of Plano School, and it does a great job of, of preparing uh, our kids for careers and for college. Uh, but we've lost a billion dollars of our own tax dollars that have gone out to other areas that are not 
operating as efficiently. And we need to have those types of operational benchmarks and those types of best practices in districts outside of our own to make sure others are being as careful about the way they spend their tax dollars and our tax dollars as we are ourselves. Um, and so, so I'm a big proponent of making sure that you have the benchmarking standards. Also, as it relates to our educators, you know, the teachers, and, and my aunt was a, a career uh, teacher in the third grade, and, and, and I mean, they really are doing God's work. They're educating our kids, and, and, and they don't get paid a whole lot of money. But one of the things we need to make sure we're looking at is that teachers' performance matters. And it's not just a matter of seniority, but we're looking at how effective teachers and principals and people in the school and the classroom are performing to make sure we're not just simply keeping people around and not getting the job done because they have some kind of seniority. So I, I think a good effective evaluation system for um, our educators is good. And last is just making sure that we're pushing the dollars that we're spending to the classroom. Um, it's not about the bigger, fancier, you know, um, uh, football stadium. Those are nice, but at the end of the day, it's about educating kids and making sure that they come out prepared for life. Very good. Stacy. So one of the, the organizations or you know, funding um, boards that I forgot to mention earlier that I wanted to get rid of would be the State Board of Education. Um, for me, I, again, like I mentioned earlier, education comes down to local control. So really the Education begins at home with each individual and the parents. So parents need to have a lot of say into you know, what their kids are learning and how their kids are learning. And then we really need to return power to the teachers who are in the classroom, who again, know the students, um, work with them on a daily basis, and know that you know, there's a lot of different ways of students learn. Not everybody likes to sit there for you know, 45 minutes and just stare at the chalkboard, or I don't even know if they use chalkboards like that, or <laughs> computer screens, or um, it's been a while since I've been in public school. Well, I actually still am in public school, never mind. We do still share this with you, but um, I do a lot more seminars, so I actually get to see people and talk to them. Um, but, you know, it isn't just about funding and throwing more funding at it. Um, and, you know, it's problematic whenever you have centralized control um, and planning of education, you know, such as at the federal level, they're trying to push Common Core, and at the state level, CSCOPE. Luckily, we're not implementing either of those. Um, but, you know, the problem comes down to, you know, teachers having to teach to standardize exams. I remember when I was going to school, it was called the TOS test. Since then, it's been called the STAR test, the TEETS test, whatever else. They basically try to change it around, change the acronym, so it makes it sound like, oh, we're actually improving education. We're, you know, teaching your students and your kids something different. But really, it's just, can you, can you pass this exam so that we can have the steps that this school needs so that we can get funding from the state? to continue teaching the next generation to pass this exam so that we can get funding for the next. That's not serving our students. That's not, you know, students are actually coming to, to college where I'm actually a teaching assistant and they're having trouble writing a five page paragraph. They can't construct sentences that make sense and that are grammatically correct and that's extremely problematic. So definitely we need to get back to local control and having teachers and parents have, have a lot of say. Mm -hmm. So I've heard everybody talk about local control <coughs> Um, and keeping decision making at a local level. Taking it one step further, how about giving even more decision making power to parents and families with vouchers? I'd like to hear from each of you if you support uh, a voucher system and giving parents choices about what, kid, what schools they send their kids to. So Matt, I'll start back with you. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you, you do have school choice within the ISD, but outside the ISD boundaries, you don't. And uh, I think giving uh, parents the option if, if they want to uh, have their children go to a school that maybe is on the way to work versus where, to, where they're home, uh, we should have that option. And um, a lot of times when we talk about school choice, though, we're trying to tackle the issue with respect to our inner city schools. And the children that really want to learn that, that are prohibited from because of the, to just the terrible environment that they're being raised, and giving those parents the opportunity to provide a, a good education for those children and you know a better school, I, I think that's paramount. I mean, I, I almost put that on the level of a, of a civil right. So it's 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 definitely an option, uh, a flexibility for parents and folks like us. Because again, we're blessed; we have you know, great schools up here. But I think vouchers and uh, school choice is really a way to tackle the inner city issues that we have in our, in our state. But beyond the inner cities, what about people in Plano? 
you know, I, so vouchers for everyone or just people? In the yeah, industry? I said it, within an ISD boundary, you have that flexibility now, but I would expand it to outside the ISD boundary as well. Okay, yes. all right, great. Glenn? You know, I think our, we're, like I said before, we're very fortunate. We have a very strong uh, public school system in our district with the PISD. Um, the, the concern I have about vouchers within our district in particular is that when you start taking those dollars out and, and, and you give parents a choice, which I think they should absolutely have the choice to send their kids to private school for educational reasons, for religious reasons, whatever it is that they want to do. But the question is, is should the government subsidize that? And, and in, in the case of our school district, where we have many exemplary recognized schools and a very strong school system, we need to make sure it stays very strong. Uh, for other areas where you don't have that quality of education, uh, um, and just to our south in Dallas, they struggle with this regularly in the DISD. I think they're making some strides with uh, Superintendent Miles, but uh, they have a ways to go. They've found you know, some success, not uh, with vouchers, uh, but with charter schools. Uh, Todd Williams, who was a, a executive at Golden Sachs, left that career, started Uplift Education, and, and really was, has found some success with charters providing exceptional quality education for those kids that don't have access to it otherwise um, in their own neighborhoods. And it's allowed a number of kids uh, to go on to college and, and complete their education. And, and so I applaud those types of targeted efforts where kids don't have access to quality education that there should be some competition and some choice available to the parents so that they can provide a quality education to their kids. Okay. Stacy, I do support school vouchers in that it does return power to the parents and it really allows them to decide where they want to send their children. But I do also understand that, you know, should, should an ISD do very well, like Plano, luckily, um, you know, a lot of people will want to come here. And so then that might be also problematic where you have an influx of people who all want to attend this one school. So I understand that there's also some issues there that would need to be worked out in that regard. Um, but I also did want to, you know, I'm glad Glenn brought that up, the whole idea of charter schools, because a lot of parents are now moving to homeschooling options because of a lot of the material that they're teaching in public school that either they don't agree with or, um, you know, the, the whole idea of um, students being taught just to pretty much pass exams. So, you know, there are a lot of other options for education. I think, you know, we need to, we need to basically keep them all on the table and don't say, you know, one is better than the other, but, you know, really allow the parents to decide which one that they really want to put their child in. Great. Okay. Thank you. So we'll move on to uh, the next topic. Let's see if we have time. Okay. I'll tell you what. So we ask you a question? <laughs> you want to ask me a question? Yeah. <laughs> uh, why don't we try to do this on the from from here forward? Let's try to limit the response time to about a minute and a half. Let's do that, and then we can pace through the rest of the stuff. Uh, and some of this you guys have already kind of talked about before. So if you just want to recap or add an additional thought, please do. So transportation um, proposed solutions, and I'm going to go ahead and throw in my follow-up question if you can address this as a part of this. And it goes back to the economic stabilization fund. Shouldn't we be drawing on rainy day funds for things that could be budgeted for in the course of, of things? So, okay, starting with Lynn. So, as, as I've already said, transportation is a big priority issue. We don't have enough funding uh, through our gas tax to currently maintain our existing roads, much less build the new infrastructure we need uh, to address the growing population. And that's a, that's a big problem because that uh, congestion will choke off future growth. Um, the gas tax has not gone up in 20 years. I'm not a proponent of raising the gas tax, but the fact is, is that fortunately cars are becoming more fuel efficient. Some cars, like electric cars, don't use any gas. And so we need to figure out how do we have drivers who are using our roads, uh, you know, properly pay for them. So, so maybe an increase in, in vehicle registration fees, you know, uh, for people that are acquiring new cars or buying used cars. To, to provide some additional funding that's making up to make up for that gap uh, where the gas ta tax is not covering. Also, we've got to stop diversions. The Texas legislature for a number of years has diverted funds out of the transportation fund uh, to pay for things like DPS and other things that are very good things, but instead of those items coming out of the general fund, they're coming out of the transportation fund, and that's only made the problem worse. Great. Okay. Stacy. Completely agree with transportation that we need to end diversions. Um, we do have enough in our budget to be spent on transportation. The problem is that all of it is not being spent on transportation. A lot of it is being diverted elsewhere. 
in, in regards to the gas sales tax as well as the vehicle sales tax. Not all of it's going to where you know funding transportation. So um, I'm all for ending divergence for that, just so that you know what what money is being budgeted for and being allocated for is actually being spent with, where it's supposed to be. Um, the other idea is you know traditional turnpikes. You know the whole idea of you know users paying it until it uh, you know the creation of of specific freeways or whatnot um, get paid off, and then after it gets paid off, you know, remove that. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> Transportation, as well as all of our infrastructure, it needs to be a high priority. There's a thousand people moving to the state of Texas every day. Um, people talk about raising the gas tax, but the reality is it was last increased in 93, and but we're collecting a billion more dollars every year from that even though it hasn't been raised. So it's a good source. And yeah, people talk about any diversions, we have to do that as well. But the problem is TxDOT has a shortfall of about $3 billion uh, annually, and the, and the diversions are about $1.6 $1. 1. billion. Uh, so there's still a shortfall. What Texas needs is a predictable source of uh, revenue for transportation. If you look historically, at one point, transportation was about 30% of the state budget. Now it's south of 10%. So we don't we talk about it in these these types of this type of environment in these forms as transportation is a priority, but when you look at our budget, it's not. It's a, it's almost a rounding area, rounding era. So what I would do is recommend that we dedicate vehicle sales tax to transportation. You could phase that in over three years, but what that would do is that would generate another three billion dollars annually for transportation, and then the diversions would be another 1.6 as well. So if we make those two changes then transportation is adequately funded within the state of Texas and we can support the growth that we have. This is the reason why we have toll roads, by the way. If you look at the city of Plano, three of its four boundaries have toll roads and it's because of the underfunding of transportation. And I've got one second left. <laughs> quick, quick question follow-up. Quick question follow for each of you guys. Then Stacy mentioned this. Um, well, two things. Do you favor turning existing state highways into tollways? That's one question. And then the second is, as Stacy mentioned, right? We're, we're going to build a toll road, and then when it's paid for, the tolls will end, and they never end. So those two questions, address those. So absolutely not. I do not believe we should turn our existing state highways or federal highways into toll roads. We've already paid for those as taxpayers, and we don't need to be paying somebody else again for the right to use them. I've seen studies that indicate that the use of tolls are three times more expensive than traditional funding mechanisms for building new transportation infrastructure. So I don't know about you, but I think we have enough toll roads surrounding our district and we don't need any more. We need to come up with other sources to fund that. You mentioned the rainy day fund and, and increases to that. I've met, May, I wanted to mention this earlier. Uh, fortunately, because of the booming uh, economy in Texas and a lot driven by <coughs> energy revenues, uh, the comptroller just actually increased the rainy day fund by two and a half billion dollars. So I think a portion of those funds should also be dedicated to new transportation infrastructure. Stacy, quick comment on that? Also agree that no, I uh, would not agree with turning you know public uh, public roads into toll roads. And really, I think what we also need to do is the reason perhaps that we have so many or surrounding us is that you know we have what's called public-private partnerships, and that you know we pay for it as taxpayers, but then they sell it to a private company who then you know increases the toll cost, um, you know however they want to, and then we continue to having to pay for that. And I don't think that's that's right, which is why you know I support traditional turnpikes where you know as if you're using it, you know you, you pay for it until you know the cost of construction and maintenance gets removed uh, or get paid off and then the toll is then removed and then um, you know you don't have to continue paying for, for increased tolls every time you try to drive on one of those. Okay, Matt. We dedicate vehicle sales tax to transportation. We won't need toll roads, we won't need turnpikes, we won't need anything. We'll be we'll, transportation will be sufficiently funded within the state of Texas. Okay. You want to meet it. Professor, right? Yeah, you're good. That's good. I, I think you've sufficiently covered that. Let's move on to quick, quick follow up and just rebuttal that. Uh, I disagree with Matt that that while you can cover the current funding costs by doing that, currently the the, the estimates are that 34 billion dollars <coughs> would be are needed to bring our current level of uh, transportation infrastructure up to the level where it needs to be and to provide additional infrastructure to meet growing demand so so I think we can get there on a on a you know stopgap measure by capturing these additional revenues and we should but it doesn't cover that 34 
billion dollar gap that's currently estimated out there uh, to provide the infrastructure needed to address current needs. And I know y'all have been on the roads, how incredibly congested they are. Go from uh, Dallas to Austin on any given day and you get stuck in traffic uh, nonstop the whole way down there. Okay, Matt, quick follow up. Well, $34 billion dollar figures over a period of time. So actually what I propose would address that. $34 billion doesn't need to be spent in one year. It's over a period of time, so it would be sufficient. One thing I would talk about as far as congestion, one of the reasons why we've got congestion in Collin County is because of all the construction that we're, that's going through. We've got widening of US 75, US 380, Preston Roads being widened all the way up to Grayson County line. We are actually very well positioned and blessed here in Collin County. We have $2 billion of transportation funding uh, here locally. The issue is outside Collin County is where we have transportation issues. But we're actually very well blessed and uh, well funded here in Collin County for transportation. Okay, let's kind of move on then. And these are some things, uh, we might even want to shorten our answers up a little bit more, but uh, on the topic of uh, Second Amendment and um, your thoughts on the gun debate, and then do you support open carry? Do you support concealed carry on college campuses? Stacey? I do, yes, yes, yes. Um, <laughs> Second Amendment rights, definitely all for them, for constitutional carry, for open carry, for carrying, um, you know, on college campuses. Was there any other one that I missed off? Is that, no, if I'm is that very clear? I hope that's very clear. I support the Second Amendment, and I support supporting your right to, to bear arms and protect yourself. Okay. Matt? Stacy's got the coolest Facebook. There's a picture of her with this big old gun, and she's shooting it. This looks really cool. <laughs> You got those pink things on your head. Yeah, you're the um, uh, This is a no-brainer. Uh, Second Amendment. You know, you know, the thing that I get frustrated about is when a, when a tragedy happens in our nation, uh, and, the, and the press uses that to try to squash our, our gun rights. It, you know, at the end of the day, the whole idea around gun-free zones and those types of things is just the silliest concept that I've ever heard of. You, know, you and I are going to follow the gun-free zone, and obviously the criminal's not. Um, so yeah, I, I, would, uh, I would be in favor of our teachers having concealed handguns to protect themselves and their, and their children. Obviously, you know, the gun-free training and licensing and, and those types of things, but um, I am really concerned about the almost daily uh, infringement on our Second Amendment rights and the attempts to do that. I'm, I'm thankful for the NRA. I'm thankful they, they gave me an A rating as far as where my stance on the issue is. But, uh, you know, Hollywood, there's a producer coming out with a movie trying to influence people's um, views on, on, on gun rights. That is a vitally important issue for us as citizens. We've got to be able to protect ourselves. That is so fundamental to our rights. Uh, that's why it's number two in the Bill of Rights. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, absolutely. I believe the Second Amendment is something that's just a fundamental right uh, to our freedom and our liberty. My dad's sitting right over here. and. Uh, um, he has guns that were given to him by his dad, that were given to him by his dad, and so that's such a vital part of you know our family tradition and our country. And so, and so uh, the Second Amendment must absolutely be uh, supported. Uh, also, on a sort of a family matter, uh, our our daughter Abby is a <coughs> Baylor, and she was in a rhetoric class last uh, semester and uh, was asked to you know uh, write a rebuttal to a New York Times. Uh, editorial piece, and so she was asking me about ideas that she's had over time. I was like, well, why don't you look at all the editorials that are likely to come up in connection with the tragedy that was around the second Sandy Hook shootings? And sure enough, there's a lot of you know anti-gun you know editorials there, and 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 she correctly pointed out in her rebuttal piece that that it's not gun control that will prevent those tragedies; it's providing proper mental health and other issues that will prevent those tragedies. I think it's it's such a, a mistake and such an infringement on our rights when the government tries to take a tragedy like Sandy Hook and, and use it to infringe our rights to, uh, to carry and bear arms. Okay. Can I do a quick follow-up? Uh, okay. I always feel like I didn't talk enough about gun rights. <laughs> I did just want to make the comment that I believe that gun control is hitting your target. Yes. <laughs> That reminds me of my favorite country and western song, Baby, I'm Missing You, But My Aim's Getting Better. <laughs> um, okay, quick question, uh, housekeeping question. If, you, uh, if you're elected and you go, and one of the things that you will have to, one of the first things you'll have to vote on is the Texas House, uh, the Speaker's race. Uh, and <coughs> 
So I'd like to know between the two current candidates that are filed, Joe Strauss, who's the incumbent, and then Scott mm -hmm. Turner from our area, who's filed to run, um, who would you support in the speaker's race and why? Matt, you, you're on deck. I'm going. I'm, I'm, I'm going out of order, and then going back. I'm really pumped that Scott Turner is running for the Speaker of the House in Texas. Is that awesome or what? Um, I have such a high opinion of uh, Scott. I go to church with Scott. Uh, he's a friend of mine. Um, I don't really play for the Redskins, but uh, what a great message that would be for our party to have uh, an African American as the Speaker of the House for the state of Texas. Uh, you know, the things that we need to look at here is beyond what the implications to us here locally as far as how that would benefit our area uh, in Collin County. But what implication would it have on our state dialogue if Scott was to be Speaker of the House? I mean, if, if you think about it, not only would he be invited to the Republican National Con Convention, but he'd probably be given a prime time speaking spot. That guy can deliver a message, he can share the gospel, he's a great minister. Uh, so I uh, not only wholeheartedly uh, vote for Scott, but I'm going to do everything I can to make sure he obtains that seat. I am pumped about Scott Turner being Speaker of the House. Okay, thank you. Okay, so now based on the rotation, I jumped ahead. Then we'll go to Glenn. Glenn, your response on that. Uh, my response is I, I, I don't know Scott. I've heard very good things about him, and I look forward to the opportunity uh, to meet him. I've met uh, Joe Strauss on a couple of occasions. Uh, um, my stance is that I would make no pledge to either one of them until I knew, you know, one, that I was going to be elected in, in the position to have the opportunity to sit down to meet with them and understand where they are on the issues and how that plays in to, you know, what we're interested here in, in our district. Um, uh, I'll just say my opponents have made some uh, uh, mention of the fact that uh, I've made prior political contributions to a number of people, which include Joe Strauss and Dan Branch and and other people like uh, our Senator John Cornyn and, uh, and Sam Johnson. And I feel like that's a part of our job as, as uh, involved and engaged uh, Republican leaders is to support good candidates. And, and, and you know, I don't know where Joe Strauss is on all the issues. I know there's some things I don't agree with that, that he does. Uh, but uh, uh, when uh, a client of mine was having a fundraiser, he asked me to contribute to him maybe three years ago, and I did. And so I, I don't, I don't uh, feel bad about that, but uh, I don't think that should cast me in any light in terms of supporting him over uh, Scott or anybody else who uh, is in the race for the speaker's you know, seat. I want to meet them, and I want to understand where they're on their issues before we pledge support to either of them. Okay, Stacy, your thoughts on that? Sure. Should I get elected to the State House for District 66? I would be proud to support Scott Turner. I think that's a pretty definitive statement. Okay, great. Um, all right, so we are we're kind of at our appointed time. We uh, we started about five minutes late, so why don't we try to squeeze in at least one more issue, and then we'll go from there. I've got three left, unless you guys agree to give me a thirty-second answer, and we'll squeeze in all three. <laughs> Could you do that? Why are you looking yeah. at me when you ask? <laughs> <laughs> Depends on what the issue you have are. the most experience at grandstanding. Oh, I'm just kidding. I'm just teasing. I say that anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, okay, so uh, we kind of already talked about. Uh, I think all you guys have said immigration would be a priority for you and protecting the border. So I'll pass on that one. I'm going to ask you about two uh, moral issues and get your responses on those, and then we'll wrap up with that. So the first question uh, is regarding the issue of life. Do you consider yourself pro-life or pro-choice, and why? Um, Glenn, we're back to you. Strong, proud, pro-life supporter, I believe, without question, that life begins at conception, and we must do everything we can to support it. Okay, very good. Stacy. I am also pro-life, and I believe that life begins at conception, and I'm cool, and I'm very proud to support it. Okay. Mr. Sheehan? <laughs> Government's job is to protect, um, protect life, and we're not doing that in this nation. We've lost 55 million old babies uh, due to abortion. Uh, so yeah, I'm pro-life, and uh, I strongly believe that every 
every little baby unborn and born is precious in God's eyes and God has a plan of significance for each one of those little babies. And I uh, recently joined the board of the Prestonwood Pregnancy Center as well, so I'm excited to uh, engage that, that issue head on. Okay, very good. And then the um, uh, second topic of marriage. Um, do you support homosexual marriage? And would you support laws to recognize homosexual marriage in the state of Texas? Why or why not? Stacy? I believe that the proper role of government is to protect every single American's life, liberty, and property. And, you know, as such, I, it's not my place to say if, you know, a homosexual marriage is right or wrong, um, that that's their life choice. And so if I'm protecting their life, I'm protecting their right to that decision. Um, you know, at one point in time, interracial marriages was against the law. You can believe it, right? And, you know, we've come a long way from then. Um, at one point in time, women weren't allowed to vote. People of color weren't allowed to vote. So we've come a long way, and I think that's the step in the right direction. Um, so then you would support homosexual marriage? Yes. Okay. All right. Mr. Shaheen? Um... The definition of marriage is pretty clear uh, biblically as far as between a man and a woman. You know, man and woman. Uh, well, you know, when we look at this issue, every every society is judged by how well it treats its children. And it's very clear if you look statistically what happens to a child, whether they have a mother or a father or not. Children need to be loved. They need the nurturing of a mother, and they need the firmness of a father. And um, you know, what people want to do in privacy that is, is their business. But we as a nation, we as a state, and we as this community need to be firm on what God's intention of marriage and what's best for our children. And it is clear, the statistics are clear. I can tell you, the vast majority of the people in the Collin County Jail that are spending the night there at night came from broken families. So when our society, when our government does anything to hurt the traditional marriage, we're hurting our children. And I'm just appalled that, you know, when an NBA star comes out and we celebrate because he's gay and he gets a phone call from the President of the United States, what kind of message is that? Um, so clearly, uh, you know, marriage is defined as between a man and a woman. Okay. Uh, I absolutely support the traditional and biblical view that a marriage is between a man and a woman. And, you know, what people do in their private lives is up to them and it shouldn't be the government interfering. But they can't expect that the government should recognize that as marriage when that's not the traditional view. And I very much uh, uh, would support the continued uh, enforcement of the Defense of Marriage Act. I think that's the, the right thing to do, and that's you know, very much a foundation of, of who we are as a country as well. Okay, very good. Okay. Well, I appreciate that, um, and thank you all for your participation and uh, for your answers and your candidness. Uh, before we started, I asked them, and we tried to wrap up uh, around our time frame, if they'd be willing to spend a few minutes to take some questions from the audience. So, um, okay, <laughs> terrific. <laughs> oh, <that's good. laughs> yeah. Eager, eager. Uh, and, and we will try to be respectful of the time frame. Uh, okay, so this gentleman right here. Thank John? You. My name's John Burroughs. Okay, just following up on the question that was just asked. My question would be, since you are, the two gentlemen are both supportive of traditional marriage, would you also then be able to say you're against divorce? Would you say that divorce should be outlawed since it's obviously not part of God's plan? Okay, all right. Should divorce be outlawed? Uh, we'll let each person respond to that. Let's... Quick, no, I do not believe divorce should be outlawed. Even though I, I understand your point, uh, uh, you know, there's there's many things that are not part of God's plan that unfortunately we do on a day in and day out basis. But I do believe marriage is one of those foundational and fundamental issues that, that is defined in the Bible as between a man and a woman. It should continue to be taught that way. Love is a very difficult thing. Um, if you're married, I, I applaud you. And, you know, it, it's, it's not every day that you find somebody that you want to spend the rest of your life with. So I think whenever, you know, whether you're you know, in, in traditional marriages or, you know, want to be in one that's non-traditional, 
to be able to find somebody you know in this entire world that you know you want to spend the rest of your life with and you know you want to take that vow with I think is is something that should be cherished whether it's somebody you agree with personally or, or something you agree with, you don't agree with so I don't think it's my right to say that somebody else cannot be with somebody else that they want to be with or outlaw divorce when they don't want yeah. to divorce. <laughs> yes. The reason why I ask you, well, hold on, let me, let's get. Oh, yeah, back. clearly okay. we're not going to do that. I mean, we have abusive, abusive situations where, you know, somebody said do it and uh, that type of thing. So now we're going to Right. Well, the reason why I ask. Well, let's, I, I, I'm going to try to. Okay. Yeah. The person, so. But it is critical. Well, I understand. Okay, let's move on. Okay, Mark. What was your question? question? If in the state of Texas the issue of the use of marijuana came up, what would each of the three of y'all's position be with regard to that? Okay, marijuana. So would you legalize marijuana? Yes. Okay. Uh, why don't we go opposite now? We'll start with Matt and come back this way. Why do you smoke cigars? Is that our own? Uh, I, I would clearly not. Um, support the legalization of marijuana. Again, if you look at our county jail population, a uh, significant number of people are in there because of uh, the repercussions of alcohol and, and drugs and, and mental, mental illness as well. But uh, absolutely not. Would not support. Okay, Stacy. I would support the legalization of marijuana. Um, you know, a lot of the jails are filled with people who are there for a lot of reasons. Um, one of them might be marijuana use or, you know, being caught with it. But, you know, basically saying that you're using something constitutes you having to be in jail and that you're breaking a law. Um, they're not really breaking any law other than the law that said that you cannot use marijuana. There's, you know, no proven studies yet that marijuana causes people to do things that perhaps alcohol has caused people to do things. Um, you know, I don't think, you know, people, if it's a non-violent crime, people should be locked up for it. And, you know, a lot of people who use marijuana don't go out then and commit violent acts of crime, whereas, you know, perhaps they might if they were using other substances. Um, so I think really we need to rethink our, our war on drugs um, because it's not serving our country and it's not serving, you know, any of us, really. Okay. Glenn? And, and I'll disagree with Stacy. I do not support the legalization of marijuana. Um, I think there have been studies to show that marijuana is a gateway drug. It's addictive. <laughs> And, uh, and, and while I understand that alcohol is, is addictive as well and creates a whole other issue, a, a, a set of issues in our society, why would we want to continue to add to that? So I, I do not support the legalization of marijuana in the state of Texas. Okay. Uh, no, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> and I don't mean to be flipped. Uh, anybody else have a question they'd like to ask? Yes, ma'am. How do you, uh, if you're elected, how do you intend to relate to your constituents on an ongoing basis? What's your communication plan? Um, this time, why don't we start with Stacy? We'll go to Glenn, then we'll go to Matt. Sure. Um, the power of social media has, you know, massively grown since I guess you know a lot of people have been in office. So definitely the usage of you know things like social media on Facebook, Twitter, as well as constant email communication. Um, but you know, as time permits, I'd love to sit down and actually go door to door and talk to people individually as well. And that's actually what I've been doing right now. And so I've heard a lot of the concerns of people who are living in District 66, you know, the issues that they're really concerned about and that they'd like to see addressed, um, as well as just generally the direction of our country and our state. So those are kind of the, the ways that I keep in touch. Okay. Glenn? I believe the government should remain open, accessible, and transparent to the people. So it's constant communication through social media, through other means, to make sure people understand what the message is coming out and being open to those messages uh, coming back. In my office, um, I have an open door policy. It means anybody can come into my office at any time and express you know, the concern that they might have. I also do a lot of management by wandering around. That just means going out and touching people where they are, trying to understand their issues and being responsive to those. Okay, Matt? That should be a primary objective of every um, elected official. As county commissioner, I probably put anywhere from 300 to 500 miles on my truck every week. And uh, so the accessibility is important. On all my materials is my cell phone number. And if you call me, I will answer the phone. Okay. Uh, anyone else? Yes, sir. Um, <clears throat> when I was actually working for a public-private utility, I was required to swear an oath to defend and protect the U.S. Constitution. Each of you, if you elected, will put your hand in the Bible and swear to uphold the 
same hope, which is to defend and protect the U.S. Constitution and the Texas Constitution from enemies both foreign and domestic. There was a good question asked about Obamacare, and you all agreed it's unconstitutional. How can you vote? How can you not vote for a bill that will nullify Obamacare, given your sworn oath? Okay. You've sworn up to protect and defend the Constitution. We've agreed it's unconstitutional. It wasn't decided correctly. So now, are you willing to step up and really do something, pass a bill that says we will not implement Obamacare in the state? Is that close? Yep. Would you do it? Okay. Uh, Glenn. Absolutely. Um, and, and as I have said repeatedly, I think Obamacare is a disaster and it, it must be stopped by all legal means possible. Um, I think notification has some problems that I've already expressed. Um, I would absolutely, you know, uh, stand by my oath to uphold the Constitution of our country and our state. But we are a nation of laws. And if you go to the point where you're just saying, I'm going to nullify laws and we're not going to go by a due process, then we become uh, a nation of anarchy and without the rule of law. Which is where we are okay. now. Stay <laughs> To reiterate again, yes, I would absolutely support nullifying Obamacare, as well as any other, you know, federal, you know, law that they've tried to pass that is unconstitutional. So maybe I would go on a nullifying spree. I might go with you. You have a spare seat. <laughs> <in your car>. <laughs> <laughs> I've taken that oath twice, uh, actually. Um, if you look at the mechanics of, of Obamacare. Um, uh, that legislation, the Medicaid expansion, has ha does not happened in the state of Texas. Uh, what we have is the federal government that opens websites and it's available for people in the state of Texas. So there's not really much we can do to tackle that. I think what we need to do as conservatives is have a conservative, conservative alternative to Obamacare. That's the way we tackle it within the confines of the Constitution and the law. But until we stop it, how do we serve up alternatives? Wait, how many, how, many people, how many people like my son have to go to jail because they refuse to pay Obamacare taxes? And if you don't do anything as elected state officials, you are not defending my son with his constitutional right to not buy health care. But if we, even, if we, even if we went to the, through the nullification process and were successful, it, those are still federal laws that are placed. It wouldn't tackle that issue. So why can't they just pass federal law and take away our second amendment? And you go along with it? What's the difference? I have to buy health care, but I can... See the difference? I don't see any difference. But, but again, it, those are those are federal statutes, so it, they're in place. There's, we don't have any type of authority or power to to reverse that. Under under a federal system, the states are more powerful than the federal government. I, I think but we need to have a whole other session. <laughs> <laughs> I need to take a minute and what Jefferson and Madison said about the Constitution and enforcing it. So we'll, we'll we'll table that for now. Okay, Mr. Gamble. I like the candidate's assessment of past legislative sessions, especially uh, Speaker Strauss and how he's handled committee assignments, legislative routing, and the other aspect of, of his job. Can you comment on past sessions and Speaker Strauss's performance? Uh, and, I, and I guess that would also entail his appointees to the calendar and to other positions where maybe conservative legislation did or did not get through and those kind of things. Can, can, can you comment? So, we're, who, yeah, who started yeah. last time? What, Matt, you, yeah, finished, you finished up with the last one. Why don't we start with Glenn and we'll go back right down. As far as uh, commenting, uh, you know, I cannot comment specifically. I've not gone back and studied, you know, who the appointments were. Um, you know, I only know generally that, that, you know, budgets were passed and there was some dissatisfaction with some of the appointments is my understanding uh, with respect to the speaker. Um, but I cannot comment with any specificity about you know what happened in any of the, the prior couple of sessions with him as the speaker. Okay, Stacy. Actually, it would be hard for me to comment on it as well. Um, I didn't follow it as closely, so I would actually also have to go back and look at it. Um, but I do know that there were some some problems with you know the appointments of committees as well as you know holding holding specific bills and letting them die in specific committees. So you know, that's definitely something I'm open to, but um, haven't had time to do so yet. I had expressed frustration earlier that we, we went into the legislative session with those three priorities and they were all three funded during the regular session. Um, I think that's a reflection of leadership. The other thing that we need to um, focus on is the pro-life bill and how 
and there's a lot of tension about the Senate and the filibuster and all that type of stuff. But that actually made its way through <coughs> at a pretty slow pace in the House of Representatives. So that could be that could have been addressed well before the end of the uh, Senate <coughs> session. And so that's a reflection on the House and the Speaker as well. Okay. Why don't we take one more question and we'll finish up with that. Uh, I've got three. <laughs> <laughs> well, I noticed that you had your hand up earlier, so why don't we take your question in the back. Thank you. My name is Matthew Tanner. Uh, back to the water for the state of Texas. Are you going to reach out to the other states around us to figure out how to get us water here? How will you do that? Because you can't make it rain. How are you going to bring us water? <laughs> <laughs> make it rain! Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so cooperation with our neighboring states. So how would you... Uh, well, we, have, we have some states that are flooding, but we're going through drought. <laughs> what can we do to help them and help us? Help me help you. Uh, Stacy? I, th I definitely think that's an option that we need to take is to, you know, talking and um, discussing with other states around us that do have that, that problem. Um, but I actually, uh, may perhaps a more non-conventional approach also to water conservation, the whole idea of, you know, Texas not having enough water is the whole idea that a lot of HOAs require, um, you know, houses to maintain very nicely cut lawns that you water and then you cut and then you water and then you cut and then if it's, you know, a little too high, you, know, you don't cut it just enough. Um, they'll send you a bill saying, you know, you're actually, in, um, you know, you're not following the HOA <laughs> rules. And so, you know, there have been some some places where, you know, people actually want to do something different with their front lawn, right? And so that's that's me. That's also an option that we can take is that, you know, allowing people within communities to say, you know, perhaps maybe it's not just about watering your lawn and cutting the lawn, but to, you know, create other, other options where you can conserve water in different ways. Okay, Matt. Well, Short of taking a agency in the National Guard and going after Oklahoma, there's, that's, there's actually been quite a bit of that. There's quite a bit of dialogue with the other states. There's, um, there's lawsuits that are in flight right now between Oklahoma uh, and the state of Texas. Um, so uh, we would, I'd be open to that and, and want to see that progress. But the reality is I think a lot of that's happening already. A lot of that's been tied up in mitigation uh, examples, the Hugo area in water in Oklahoma. I think what we need to do is look at alternatives to reservoir water, groundwater, desal, those types of things. In Collin County, we only use 2% of our groundwater, so there's lots of different opportunities with respect to water and infrastructure. Glenn? Absolutely think we should push, you know, and, and try to find ways, and Oklahoma in particular has been somewhat reluctant to work with us, so we've got to, you know, continue to push that to make sure we have access. Another issue that's just, you know, befuddling to me is the fact that Texoma, which supplies 25% of our water for this area, has not been able to supply that water because of this thing called the zebra mussel. Um, we can send men to the moon, we can come up with vaccinations that will cure cancer, but we cannot deal with the zebra mussel. We've got to call you know, the EPA and you know, the, the federal uh, authorities that deal with this issue and get that solved. There, it's a big priority issue, and that's 25%. I know that the pipeline's supposed to be coming through, and that's going to help, but, but there's got to be a solution to that other than just saying we can't have the water out of Texoma because of the zebra mussel. Okay, well, very good. Well, lastly, again, um, I'd like to thank the audience for your attendance tonight and uh, your rapt attention. And then lastly, I'd like to thank all these candidates for their time and their answers, and if we could give them a hand. Thank you.